On this episode, we bring it in Helsinki. Clap it up. This is Gary Vaynerchuk and this is episode 283 of the Ask Gary V Show. For everybody who's watching the show, if you can tell the lighting, it is 9 fucking p.m. here in Helsinki and it's light out like it's one in the afternoon. That's what I love about this place. Let's clap it up for Helsinki, the host city of this. I'm in an amazing room, DRock Improv it, show it a, real quick. I'm in an amazing room of incredible business leaders and influencers. Uh, amazing influencers here in the Nordics and Helsinki specifically. I'm here giving a keynote tomorrow morning at Arctic 15, which I'm very excited with, uh, with my business associates, Jan and the rest of the team. I'm excited for the hospitality. Long flight from New York, very little sleep, but the momentum of the people, the energy, and the event are pushing me through. Uh, I also, as you can tell, have a very handsome guest here today. So for the Vayner Nation, why don't you tell everybody uh, who you are and a little bit about your story. Hey, what up? I'm Jarn Lazala. I'm one of the Duchens. You might have seen our TV shows. They are pretty crazy. We do a lot of stunts. But I'm also uh, the owner of the biggest production company here in Finland. We produce like most of the biggest shows over here. And nowadays I also call myself a YouTuber because that's my passion to create films, come up with great stories and uh, edit and all that, so. When did you make the transition to looking at YouTube as a viable, more? I assume, actually, let me take a step back, assumptions are dangerous. Did you always want to make films or movie? Were you a creative kid? Like, how did it go down? Yeah, I was like 16, 17 year old when I got my first video camera and I just started filming skateboarding, snowboarding and that. it was just my passion to create films Yes. and uh, film my friends. So it's like I've been searching for happiness all my, all my life so it's, it was natural just like spend time with my friends and film funny stuff and like goof around so that's, that was the start. And at what point did you think from 16 to 17 you're filming, you're goofing around, you're having some fun, what, uh, what point did you think, wait a minute, this is something I can do for a living? Right away was that the aspiration? Uh, no, well, I actually started as an intern at this small, small cable TV channel. And I came up with a new TV channel, a TV show idea called The Dutchens. And we just started doing the stunts and Jackass wasn't there at that time. Like, was not? Was not, like like when we started doing the show. And, uh, and when our first... Do you think those Americans ripped you the fuck off? No, no, we're okay, actually... Okay, I just we're, want to make we're, sure. We're friends. Okay, got uh, it. And <laughs> when we actually did the Dutchens in America series back in the US, Joey Knoxville was the ex- executive producer. That's that cool, show. that's so, cool. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, were, you pitched as it, as an intern you pitched that TV idea or a little bit later? Uh, I mean, I was an intern. I just went back to my uh, boys and started filming with them and I didn't tell anybody. I just did the show and... You brought it in? Yeah, I just brought it in because that way I knew that I have the rights for the show. <laughs> and, and when you brought it in, were they like, this is amazing? Or they were like, yeah, they were. right yeah, away? They were. Yeah, right away. Right, right. Wow, nobody has done anything like this, so yeah. And they put it on the air? Yeah. And how long ago was that? That was in 2001. And what happened? Instant hit? Well, or it, was, sl- it, was, it was a small channel, but it was a big hit on that channel. But, and then actually a national channel got instra- interested about the show, and uh, Channel 4 here in Finland. So, and it, it got, but Finland is a small ch- country, so when big things get big here, they're not big internationally. I get it, but you must have been thrilled being big in the pond that you were swimming in. Yeah, well, we had a good time. Yeah. But, but we were aiming international. Like we used the whole to, time. Uh, yeah, there was like this famous skateboarder from our hometown called Arto Saari. Yep. And like, and all of the skateboarders, the snowboarders here in Finland, they wanted to go international. So that was our goal, to go international. And then, then we started filming in English and and when you do stunts, like big stunts, we just wanted to be the craziest stunt group in the world. So yes. we just like, and I was always the guy who came up with the ideas. So I just wanted to create the, like the craziest stuff. Like push it to the extreme. Yeah. Like, like basically get very close to your best friends dying. Well, we got really close. Right. Yeah, yeah really <laughs> like, you know, guys are laughing, but it's like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, because we like, have, what was the scariest well, out of all the uh, through all these years? When were you the most like, holy shit, my friend might die? 
Uh, there was a well, there's a few, but I mean, but the closest. Uh, well, we had like I had an idea that we are, were gonna blow up this building. Because, okay. Like, because like whenever you see like someone explodes a building, it goes down really nicely. Yes. Like that. Yep. So it's safe to be on the roof, right? Like sure. I guess. The roof. I mean. Not, <laughs> so. So the thought was, you'll stay on the roof and I'll go like this. Yes. Yeah. And, and but it went like this. <coughs> Yeah, well, what happened is the roof came down first, and my in. my dear friend Yarpi, like he fell inside of the building, and the wall started falling on him, and he was well, he was attached to a crane and a rope, so but it, it was a really close call. Like he almost died. Yeah. Like he should have died. No. Okay. Ne- ne- like no, ne- no, 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 no. Well, but you yeah. were happy he didn't. Well, I, that was a really scary moment. Yeah. And and there has been a few, and we, but we've been I don't know, but we've been really lucky that yeah, like on the boat. When did the transition happen to wait a minute? This YouTube thing is obviously YouTube's been around since '05. Yeah. You know, but coming from the TV path, you know, not being a 14 year old, mm. it was more playing in the background as you were ascending. When did it really get your attention as like, wait a minute, this is a very important medium? Well, for a very long time, we didn't have time to do anything for YouTube. Because I get we were it. busy doing, doing the, the show. Dish. Yeah, and, and it was like after we did, did, we did the huge show in, from MTV in the US. Uh, after that, we started looking at the YouTube. And it was just a platform when, where we can do whatever. Like we didn't have right, to do was, the, like, right. huge stunts. Like we can have like smaller ideas and like like hidden cameras and like funny stuff. So it, it was just like for us, we just. I it guess was we, more creative freedom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what happened with that channel? When did you guys really start producing for it? I think it was like 2011, 2012. And at the moment, was that, on, that, on that channel, we have like three million subscribers at the moment. And at the time, was the fame in other parts of the world, did that drive the YouTube channel to success right away or that took some time as well? Uh, well, the, most of our success in YouTube came because we did a lot of collabs. We did collabs with Roman Atwood, a lot of the mm-hmm. pranksters. Uh, although we were new guys in YouTube, but those guys had been watching our TV show, so they were kind of like fans of those of shows. Of course, you guys so were OGs re- to them. Yeah, so it was easy to do collabs with them. Yes. And we brought them to here to Finland, and so our channel get, got a really great push. Before we go into the Q&A of all these great creators and entrepreneurs, what what's on your mind these days? Like, what is, what is a big focus of yours now, or what is an ambition of yours now? Is there a channel, a medium, a style that you're looking to succeed in? Or it's like, it, it has changed a lot. It's like now I'm a father of three children. Yes. And, and of course, I'm already... Any stunts with the kids yet? Well, they do their own stunts, yeah. Okay. Uh, like, uh, their own pranks? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but now it's like, it's been, this has been a, such a great journey. So nowadays I'm gonna like educate, well still educate myself, but also my audience, kind of like share my story. And, and because I have been chasing my dream for like 15, 16 years. And we all, we, we like, we made deals in Hollywood and like, but I kind of like figure out that this is just, like life is so much more than just work and like, it's like, focusing on, on your work and on your ambition. So kind of like, I'm just trying to find a balance in my life. Like I understand. how much I work, how much I spend time. And are you communicating to your audience as you go through this journey of work-life balance? Well, I don't show my family in, the, in, the, in my yep. videos, but it's more about kind of like nowadays I do a lot of things which really make my, myself happy. So I'm, yeah, I'm sharing my story like how I'm finding happiness in, in life. And okay. really like, also like, because I'm being really, uh, demanding on myself. Yes. Like, and of course, a lot of my success came from that. Of but, course. But like, really like, focusing more on loving kindness and how can I can bring like, uh, is like compassion to yourself. Yes. Like, so it's kind of like, uh, I've been changing uh, like the, like how I become the happiest person on earth for a long time, but now I have realized that it's, it might not be the one that I just like. It's not the path that you necessarily thought it yeah, was going yeah, exactly, to be. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Do you, you know, it's interesting, uh, staying on this subject for a second, listening to you, I, I feel like, and I'm sure this will make sense to a lot of us in this room and people watching at home, everything happens so much faster now. You know, I grew up, and I'm sure looking around the room, some of you as well, 
you know, that, you know, we didn't have billionaire 20 year olds back in the day. We didn't have, you know, the speed of success because of the internet. You know, you're sitting here talking, how old are you? I'm 38. Right, you're 38 years old. You sound like an 83 year old (laughs) looking back at life, you know. One of the things I'm fascinated by is everybody achieving success, failure, you know, a lot of things in life at a rapid pace that we've never seen before. To to listen to a 38-year-old man be this retrospective of his life at this point, while modern technology and hell, I'm like, you know, you're talking, I'm like, this fucking dude's gonna live for another 70 years. I I think it's a very interesting time in society where wisdom and empathy and a lot of other things are emerging at a younger age, yet there's so much, I mean, I feel like you may go, I'm almost, you're talking, I'm like, I'm guessing to myself, I'm like, this dude's gonna live, he won, now he's going through this stage where he's figuring out a new chapter. I think we all kind of go through that, even at our youth and teenage years. Um, But I was sitting here, I'm like, oh, he's gonna go deep in like four years into something altogether new and do that, you know, do you feel, do you feel that sense? Do you understand, I mean, you're you're deploying a very retrospective, you know, POV right now and energy, yet you're a kid. Sure, and I feel like, well, I believe that we are all kids. Like when I look at you, I see like five year old guys. Yeah, I feel it. Like and, and, <laughs> I feel like and I'm that, five years old. That's how I feel like everybody should watch, look at themselves. Yeah. Like we're all five year olds. Yeah. That's the thing. Like we like we think we're adults and we should know how these things work, but we don't know shit. Uh, you're and preaching. It's, like, it's so much easier when you think about yourself as a five year old to be like really kind. But, of you, but you know what's interesting? Right. It's one thing. It's one thing for all of us to stay youthful and energetic and things of that nature. It's another thing to have accomplished something, be 38, think about all those balances. From a practical sense, like, you're probably gonna live for another 70 years. Ah, I hope, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like two more lives. I don't know, I I just think it's a super interesting time. I appreciate it. Let's let's open it up to the audience. Who's got a question? I know we went very heady. Like, if somebody's first question is like, how do I get more Twitter followers, that's fine. (laughs) Like, you know, wherever it may be. Yes, my friend. Hi, Doreen. I'm Ronnie. I'm a Finnish YouTuber. Two years ago, I started making videos full time, and I started following you back then. And I just was like, okay, I will upload every single day because Gary is making so many videos. <laughs> yes. Content that, okay, how can I, I? I cannot do it. Of course, I can't. So yes. I and now my channel just blew up, and everything is great, all the success. But at the same time, I have heard you sometimes say that. You wish that when you were younger you would party more and have more fun. Yes. And I'm also thinking about the same things that I can make my videos and yes. create my content, but at the same time, how about going to a beach and yeah. life and the weather and such? Look, I think it's it's a great question, especially what we're talking about. Look, I, I think that first of all everything comes in context. I legitimately worked from 20 to 30, seven days a week, 15 hours a day, every single day. Like, I took no time, zero. So, do I wish that I took maybe a week, you know, a year? I do, Um, but it also comes back to your point, which is, my biggest thing is, you know, you know, especially I always love when I'm in Europe because Europe always has this funny, you know, overlay, you know, I was born in Eastern Europe. I've, I grew up in the wine business so I spent so much time in Europe and Europe has a far more progressive point of view on work-life balance and things of that nature. For me, I don't care if you work 100 hours a week for the rest of your life or four hours a week. I think back to the energy that he was deploying and I think I can relate to it. You have to be respectful of your ambition. I think the biggest issue I have right now is people need to be more self-aware of what makes them happy. Yeah, exactly. You know, so for me, being a workaholic is far more happiness than not. Like to me, the process is my drug, not the stuff, not anything else. So, I, you know, look, you're so young, you, you'll be able to accomplish all of it. You know, I, I, when people ask me what would I tell myself, sure, like, you know, I, I think about spending a little bit more time with my wife before kids, with with my friends post college. But I don't tru- I don't 
I don't regret it at all because it was what allowed me to have the foundation and I feel at 42 or 38, I feel like a kid. I feel like I can do a lot of things. They're different. There's different things when you're single with a family. There's a million different things. My biggest thing is you're not gonna know the alternative. The biggest thing about people looking backwards that I always try to tell, or when kids come to me or older people, they're trying to make a decision, I always try to remind them, no matter what decision all of you are gonna make, you're not gonna know what would have happened if you did the other thing. So I, you know, I think like, you know, people try to control things that are not controllable. You know, I'm sure both will work out. You know, could you go, you know, for example, let's say you leave here, inspired by other people's questions or things of that nature, and you decide you're gonna take two weeks extra vacation that you would have never taken every year. In 11 years, you'll be like, I'm so glad I did that. Why? Because you'll have these incredible experiences in Ibiza and Egypt and, and New York, right? What you don't know is maybe if you did work those two weeks, one of those videos would have changed everything and all the other business and competitive things that you wanted to achieve would have been achieved, yet you didn't get it because you went on the fucking beach in Ibiza. That is my problem. (laughs) And more importantly, you just won't know. You're gonna know what you do. You don't know what would have happened. Thoughts? Yeah, and you don't, I don't think you need to be thinking like, what if? Like, the only thing that really matters is like, just be really thankful for yourself and you're doing whatever you're doing. That's the main thing, I think. Like, it's like, and just like, say, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Like, you did this. And try to enjoy it. Try to be present when you, when you do your videos. I think, I think when you listen to this, that's, to me, the ideological, altruistic, good feeling that, by the way, I live that. I, I live exactly like that. I also answered with the actual practical thing. I think a lot of times when people get crippled by these questions that I think we all struggle with, they don't go to the practical part. Brother, you're not gonna know. So when you're not gonna know, and you can be thankful for what you do know, it gets real simple. And I just think people are spending too much time dwelling or looking backwards or debating on things that ultimately don't play out. So, you know, I would go with whatever feels best at that moment. You know, you feel like you wanna take a vacation, take it. You don't, don't. I think way too many people are playing by the rules of the current state of what's politically correct instead of really listening to themselves. People give me unlimited parenting advice on DM and email. They don't know anything, I'm like you. I don't share anything about my family. They have no context, none. But they have an ideology of how they see it. They think I'm working too hard. I respect that, I understand. I also know that so many of my friends who work nine to five, when they go home, they watch TV and work on their phones. So you know, quality, quantity, relationships, what my wife and I grew up with affected how we see it, you know, our kids, the age of our kids, my eight and five, like there's a million different things. So I wouldn't beat yourself up. Yes, sir. In similar lines, uh, I'm the author of the Firehackers Handbook. It's a big ass book. Yeah, (laughs) you need one. I get it. (laughs) I burned out doing all this startup stuff. Yes. I was putting the hours in. Yes. I was raising the money. Yes. I was hustling. Yes. I was in an overactivated, sympathetic nervous system activated state. Yes. Most of my time. So my question to you, how do you stay accountable to yourself when it comes to health and well-being? And how do you keep up the energy levels? Like, what supplements or drugs are you on to <laughs> do what you do? <laughs> yeah, so for me personally, to answer it directly, uh, none. No supplements, no drugs. You know, I always laugh because I'm so high energy naturally. I'm sure if I like did my chemical testing, there's you know adrenaline and other things that I have way naturally off the charts. I I was born in the Soviet Union. I was raised in a household that is so anti-medicine. Like if I took an Advil right now, I'd be unconscious. <laughs> like it's cr- outside of wine, the alcohol of wine and sugar. It's very, I mean, I've never tried smoking a cigarette. Like, I'm, I've never done a single drug. By the way, I'm actually not anti it. It's just not something I ever gravitated or. You never need it. I never need it. You know, I probably needed the other thing, right? Like, if you really think about it, I'm overstimulated. Um, so think I. Think about that. How well. Bring that down. You know, it's funny, easily. Like, like it's, cri- like, 
you'd be blown away by the quality of my sleep. Like I'm, like I've been up. I only slept two hours. Like on this because I flew over. I didn't sleep. It was a bad time. I tried because I knew I was in trouble. I got two hours when I landed, and we've been going. So I haven't. I, I will go upstairs and I will fall asleep. And I have a million. Th- I've, you know, I hate being in not the time zone of my business because there's all sorts of shit going on right now. Like in my pocket, I can feel the anxiety because <laughs> because look, when you're the CEO of an 850 person company, all your life is about is problems. You know, it's really funny thinking about business. I have so much empathy because I grew up so much in the startup culture. There's so much anxiety and issues of building to get to the company to be successful. And then what you find out is it's even worse after you make it a success because now you're accountable to even more people, which is really where it, it, the rubber hits the road. I think for me it's perspective. My, I give my great grandma and my grandma a lot of credit. They've brainwashed me. <clears throat> when I was a little child, that health was the only thing that mattered. In Russia, in Soviet Russia, in the Soviet Union, people died in their 50s. It was a miserable place. The alcoholism was through the roof. Nobody had, like, it was a terrible place. Like, like if you made it to 60 during, like, my parents' generation, like, that was like, you're old. So, health was, you know, I kind of, am only happy or upset based on the health of like the 10 people I care about. So I don't feel, I feel micro anxiety. I call it micro anxiety, like it's what I do. It's my profession. I have a responsibility. I'm competitive, I wanna win, I wanna be successful. But in the scheme of things, like I always play the game of I achieved everything I ever wanted professionally. I get a phone call and my mom's been killed in a car accident. Like how do I, I'm very good with my own feelings. I can trick myself. I feel terrible. It doesn't mean anything. So I've always been able to put it in perspective. I'm, I feel like I'm an athlete. Like on the ice, on the court, I'm fucking in it, right? Like I'll trip you and like fuck, you know, I'm in it. But as soon as the game's over, I'll get, you know, I'll get a, like I'm good like that. Business for me is that field. I think it's perspective. I don't struggle with it and it's why I'm so, I almost feel the reason I make content is I feel guilty. If you really, like I don't talk, I talk about it a little bit about, I feel that I was parented and was gifted and had circumstances in a certain way that created so much happiness that I'm trying to put out content. I feel like so many more people are happy because they consume my content because I suffocate their excuses and that's how you actually become happy. Like happiness, I think, follows accountability very closely. Once you realize you're completely in control, like you get a hell of a lot happier. So I don't, I don't supplement. I did four years ago get very serious about my health. I knew that I wasn't going in the right path. My, I mean, now looking back at the pictures, I think I look terrible. But at the time, it wasn't obvious because of just my frame. Uh, I hired a full-time, you know, trainer, nutritionist. Like it's been game-changing. But I'd be lying to everybody in this room if I said I have more energy. <clears throat> I think in 20, 30 years, I may feel the effects of it. Of course, it makes sense. But perspective and gratitude um, are really a driving foundation for me. You? <sighs> <laughs> well, uh, for me, it's like I, I well, I I do mindfulness. I practice mindfulness. And, and does that mean you meditate? I meditate every day. And How long? For an hour. Usually. What t- what time usually? Usually in the morning. In before the be, in the shower. Yeah, I wake up before my kids and my wife. You'll sit in the shower for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. I like that. It's, it's, I like being like, in the shower it's, too. It's it's great. And uh, but another thing is like whenever I feel, like I have had a burnout as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I know this is very easily like when when my body isn't in, in like something is wrong. And then I just like usually I just need to feel feel something. Like right now we're doing this. A uh, great show called Dutch's Home Invasion, where we actually move into a family which has a problem. Like the dad is workaholic or the kids are bullied in school, and we move into the family and help the family. That's cool. Yeah, that's a like I think this that's the best show. Yes. And and because also the viewers can learn a lot from the. Hundred percent. So, but a lot of feelings go through when you're filming that show. Yes. And it's just so important to like feel those feelings. Yes. And and for me, it's more like uh, when I, I was also a workaholic when I was younger and I felt like whenever I felt a little bit bad, I just worked. 
because I got so much satisfaction out of work. Makes sense. And and reaching my goals. And nowadays I just know that, well, if I feel a little bit shit, I just need to feel there's some kind of feeling inside me which I have to get out. Yes. And then I feel better. And, How about and before I got here, I was like scared. Like, wow, shit, like this audience and yes. doing this. So I just had, well, actually I made I meditated for 15 minutes, just like just and it helped. Uh, it helped. I just told myself, cool. yeah, you're, you're you're scared. You're like yeah, which is fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. Talk to me about what you're doing from the hacking standpoint, because I think one of the more interesting things is like the thing that I'm fascinated by is branding of and why it got there. Like why cannabis got there, why alcohol got there, why tobacco, why sugar, why the pills that are accepted, the pills that are not accepted, so much macroeconomics, so much you know, government involvement, so many variables. What about for you, what has worked? Let me show you. Sure. I'll show you one drug. Okay. It's called Facebook. Facebook, <laughs> I've heard of it. I'm on Facebook right now. Yes. Take a look at this. <laughs> Got my fix. Interesting. Let me show you another. So what you layered on top of it that you have to you have to do that to open it? So what I'm doing here, I'm creating distance between the stimulus and the reward. At the moment when it triggers the reward, the dopamine release is yep. not associated with getting a notification. It's associated to a deep breath that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Yep. Which is the rest state and that creates distance and you have a few seconds to think what the fuck are you doing yes <laughs> and what about doing that so I think it's fast so I think that's super rad and then the question becomes when are we going to be more thoughtful about all of the stimulants because I think we demonize new technologies yet they're everything we interact with I mean it's happening right now. It's, ha- it's happening to you right now as you present in front of us. I think it's gonna be interesting to see, first we're gonna start with demonizing this because that's just what we do, but when are we then going to also interject that back to, it's funny how I think about meditation. <coughs> I'm so drawn to it, like, and yet I don't do it, yet because I feel like I'm always doing it. I don't know, I don't fully have it, I don't fully have it all figured out, it's, but it's a very interesting conversation we're having here because I feel like you did it for a real life thing. Makes sense, it's a little bit of a bigger stage. But I, I, I can see a very, it's very easy for me to see the pieces here of people really doing these micro moments often, almost in every, I would argue if I saw a human doing it in every transition of everything they do, every day, in seven or eight years, I'm like, oh, I know how we got there. It started with that, then we realized it's real life too, and including traffic and television and talking to another human being. It's gonna be interesting to see like how far or where this goes. So when it comes to Silicon Valley, it's, um, it's a system that optimizes engagement on those apps. And they're not just using human creativity to achieve that, but they're using also computers. They trigger the very primitive reward mechanisms in all of us. I mean, I did all this consultation for companies. Of course. To do that. And now I understand what kind of a drug it is really. And uh, it's, it's kind of triggering the very primitive needs to belong, to be recognized. Sure. Feedback to be um, in presence of others. And it's almost like eating a meal without actually touching it. So you kind of open it, you're trying to get, you know, that connection to someone else, but it's not a real connection. It is not. It's, it feels like something like, but you, you, you are left um, uh, longing for more. And this is what many studies show. People get depressed, they, get, they feel anxious. Um, they try to fix their need, but they're not getting what they're looking for in that pocket car. The, big, the bigger issue at hand is that psychology is out, that, that science, that skill set is out the bag now, meaning this is being layered into everything, no different than what casinos did with oxygen and music, no different than what stores do with scents and smells. It's just, I think it's more in the, you know, maybe you didn't realize it was happening, 
but it's always kind of, you know, been happening. And all business is like that, isn't it? Of course, because the math is now in place and we're gonna be able to do it. So what it is really all about is to become conscious about what's going on. That's right. To recognize how you play part of this system. That's right. And in waking up in that moment, you can take control of it. Because you have to recognize yourself and your own habits to be able to then decide if you're gonna do something about it. I get it. Otherwise, you're being dragged around uh, and you don't know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that we're gonna have to reconcile is we're being dragged around, period. This is not a Silicon Valley issue. The, you guys are being dragged around here by the structure that's been put in place here and I am in America and on and on. And I mean, dragged around gets very macro very fast, which is gonna be interesting to see us reconcile. Yes, sir. As we just got discussed earlier, so I'm in the process of acquiring a company and I think it has an amazing potential, great technology. Yes. They spent millions on that, but zero more or less on the brand. And yes. The brand is pretty weak. Yes. So would you keep, if we have a fresh new start, would you keep the old brand and make it great or would you create a whole new brand? Well, I think, Everything. I think the benefit of buying a business, and I got a little context for all the viewers, yeah. an incredible technology, zero brand. Yeah. You know, the great thing there is when they didn't build any brand, you're not dealing with the baggage of them not creating any brand. The, literally, no joke, the thing I would tell you is what I take, tell a lot of my friends in this scenario, if you feel an affinity towards the name, like if it feels like your own, like if you're adopting, it's like adopting a child, like if it feels like your own, then run. You don't have to. But if it feels like something else, or you don't feel like it's a great name for wh- what the product is, I think it's also super fine to brand it something else. It, they haven't put anything into brand. You're not giving up anything by changing the name. At the same token, if you feel an affinity towards it, you actually also mentioned that you had worked on it before, so maybe you're feeling a little closer to the name, which is great. Look, I'll tell you one thing about names. I will forever believe this. Names are made. (coughs) Nike doesn't mean anything. Google doesn't mean anything. Heineken doesn't mean anything. Like, names are made. And so I, I think so many people spend unlimited times on the name without realizing the execution to make the name mean something. You know, that's my two cents. Any thoughts? Well, we, we went through, like, when we were thinking, like, what's our name? Because we didn't have a name. And we came up with the name called Duchens. Uh, our or- original name here was Duchenit. And it came from that. Uh, so we, we created that name, obviously. So. Like, and I, I, I know that you know the right answer. What are you gonna do? So you will know it here, yeah. You know why? Back to the answer. They're both either right or wrong depending on how well you execute. <laughs> like, like, people overthink it. Like, I, I really believe that. Okay, My man. Hey, man. Hey, man. So, uh, because of you and uh, we have context, uh, I built like a personal brand in Norway. I got gigs. I got the, all the Broadway shows for the Norwegian, Norwegian con- like Broadway contracts. I've done TV. Now I want to move. I really want to uh, do the have a production company like you do the production company. You have a production company uh, into the, the motion pictures. Okay. But uh, I don't see the practical way of not asking for uh, raising money, and, I, 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 and I'm well, there, a fan of that. I like the, to build from the scratch. There's a practical way. Yeah, so. so it's just gonna I, take I, you seven years. Yeah, so what, what, what's your thoughts <laughs> on that? You, 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 you would, uh, would you ask, raise money? Because you talk all the time about do, the, do selling versus raising money, and <clears> I've always done that. My, like, that's the immigrant in me, right? And, and, um, and we just grind it out. And I'm not sure that should I now suddenly go out and raise money, it will take me one year, or should I do the seven year thing? I mean, I think it's a very personal question. I think there's a time to raise money. I think there's a time to do it yourself. One of the things that I like that you've got going for you is you're not trying to build some sort of business that doesn't exist or has some crazy technology behind it that you need to be first. No, I want to build a boring business. Right, <laughs> I get for, it. For me. You want to build something that's a, a boring by the standards of yeah. AI and yeah, cryptocurrency, yeah. Yeah. but for you, it's exciting to build a production company. Yeah. 
to me, that's exactly, especially how old you are, that's exactly the scenario to wait and, yeah. and not give up control and deal yeah. with all that stuff. Yeah. It becomes a game of patience. So, so the, just if I could. Yeah. Uh, how would you, because I know all the marketing now, I know how I would like promote it, <coughs> the, the film, but how would you sell it? Because in time that, that tickets in the cinema, like the theater tickets, it's, would that be the only way? How would you go about selling a motion picture? How would I market a motion picture? No, how would you sell it? Like, how would you uh, sell what? To, to get the revenue. So let's say. Oh, you mean ha- guy, if I made a movie right now? Yeah. I would sell it traditional. I don't think there's any, in, right this second, yeah. I don't think there's any way to get the same economics. Like, you could sell it up front to Netflix. Right, you yeah. could, yeah. Uh, or 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 you know Hulu or Amazon, but I don't think that this second yeah. there I would I would probably still go through theatrical and things so, of that nature. So for the first project to to get the developing, you would you would get an extra job or do an extra gig or do something that you, it's your money and you put it out to develop, or you would raise that money, or you would because. Either way, we need the money to develop it. I, based on what I know about you, which is little, but a little bit, I would start with people, I, I in your scenario, and for a lot of people watching, if I really believe in myself, I think the best thing to do, I, well, let me phrase, I've never really raised money. I've got a secret wine project coming out this fall, and I raised money. Now let's ask me, instead of giving you, in theory, let me give you what I did. Even though I could have done it myself, I had a lot of different reasons why I wanted to, I raised money from people that I'm closest to, Mm. which is a very interesting game. I had to make a decision with myself that if I fail, I will personally pay back the $3 million. If I were you, I'd probably raise money from the closest people you know, and you say to yourself, if I fail, I'll I'll spend the next five or six years paying everybody back. I think that's a, I love that idea because I think it keeps you disciplined. First of all, for all the people that have raised money and all the bullshit of Silicon Valley that I lived through in that decade, when you're raising, do you know how many people, I mean, it happened again this week. Again this week, somebody emailed me to introduce me to somebody and I could see the email below and the guy's like, hey, can you get me to Gary Vee? This guy lost $300,000 of mine. Lost, lost. I haven't heard from him, not a sorry, not a, nothing. Just an email one day from the lawyer saying the company's uh, you know, folding and there's a couple of dollars and you'll, Gary, you'll be getting $17 back to reconcile. <laughs> this is real. I haven't talked to him 19 months. Cold email, Gary B, can you, can you meet this kid, see below. P.S., haven't caught up with you since the last company. Learned a lot. <laughs> Feel ready for the next one. <laughs> and so, you know, to me, when you're this young and you've scrapped, it's very easy to get seduced to raise the capital. I don't want to do that. Understand. Very easy to. Yeah. When it's blind faces or even people like me that you kind of know, but they're not your, I'm not in your inner 1550 circle. It's easier to lose their money. When it's easier to lose somebody's money, you play looser. House money. If you borrow it from the people that you have to know for the rest of your life, and then you have to go and execute, one, you're gonna first ask yourself if you're ready for the, to do it. Yeah. Right? You're gonna say, fuck that. I don't wanna lose my aunt and my best friend and my one business mentor's money. Yeah. Or you'll say, yes, great. But you'll also know that if you lose, you've not only lost on what you're gonna do for two years, you're gonna lose another five years on the back end because you're gonna do whatever it takes to pay them back whole because you can't walk around with that guilt. I'm a very big fan. People say don't do it all the time and I actually think it's the reverse. I think do it all the time because it forces you to do the right things. Yeah, so raise from the closest. I would raise from the closest. or development and then sell it traditionally. I would now, but again, let's play it out. Just because I know we're going a little long here, uh, but I think it's a good learning experience. Cool, you raised 350, 700,000. You're going and selling, you're a good salesman. You got a shtick, right? You got energy. You find yourself in, in, in LA and Facebook 
hears about it and is now doing films, not just shows on watch. And you get an email and they say that they want to pay you two million up front. You think you've got a blockbuster, but you also have this $700,000 nut behind you. You know, I think what people don't do is they don't act patiently. You could sell it, it, you could go whole, make some bucks. If it slams, maybe you left a lot of money on the back end, but you just gained so much leverage that you can go and get studios reaching out to you left and right. So, because of what? Well, because if the reason a $2 million upfront deal to buy your film with nothing the back end for you yeah. is a good idea is you've won. Yeah. And if it does great, you may be upset because you know you left maybe $10 million on the table on the back end. Yeah. But what people don't talk about is the fact that now you have a hit on your hands and people are reaching out to you yeah. to do the next one. Now, maybe you're a one hit wonder, yeah. maybe. Maybe you're not, but those are the things I yeah. think you need to reconcile. I want to, set up, I want to set up for that so I can do the second movie and the third movie and I don't care about my pocket, the back end, but I business need to go around. I got it. And I, somehow it needs to get revenue. Well, then then I would make a movie and sell it. Yeah. Sell it without putting up the... the you, just raise the upfront development. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. Yeah, you can do it. I didn't, I didn't have any knowledge how to... Yeah. Build a production company. Uh, are you gonna do it on your own or with no, your I, 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 Bless of you. Of course, I need to. I need other people that are skilled at what they do. But but um, it's it's like you know I'm so I'm a big hip hop fan and I like Jay Z and built Rockefeller. You know when he didn't get signed. Um, and you have all these people that has their own production company. I just want to tell new stories. Yeah. You know. Uh, and put them to, to the light. As long as you look at the things that you admire and yeah. really understand what the lineage was. Yeah. Like, there's a million people that have Rockefeller, every single hip hop kid on Instagram, yeah. right now, right now, if you t- hashtag hip hop, you click on any account, yeah. it's like young BBBBB, yeah. and underneath it's like, you know, his or her Rockefeller. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rockefeller, you know, because he went out and executed it yeah. over a 25 year period. Yeah. So for one year now, I, I have, um, just for my own sake, built a small production company that produces like social media content. Of course. J- just for me to learn yep. the corporate world. Yep. And and by that, there's a lot of people that I probably could raise money, but I still want to, you know, I, I want to do it practical. I want to have the revenue. I want to do the sale. I, I like not, not do the sale, but I want to sell the movie. I, I want to... Pati- patience yeah. is your friend. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You got it. A uh, question. You got a little bit of a context, but... I wrote a book on, on AI, uh, like a layman's guide to AI. Is it finished? Uh, and uh, just to, to give you a bit of a, I was a nobody when I did the book. So like normally it's professors or, or consultants who do it to sell their stuff. I had a real job, I, I, I run a company, but it was when we moved back to Finland, I realized that very few of, of the people who are decision makers grasp what, what is the power of AI. Yes. I wrote the book. By the way, that's not just Finland. That's yeah, the whole but, fucking but, but, world. Yeah, but that's what I felt when I come yep. to Finland. And and so I wrote the book. It became a bestseller. It's the best-selling business book in Finland this year. Yes. And the way we're heading is like, well, of course, people are, are getting to grasp it. But also now when we're uh, we're getting a translation. It's going to be in English later this year. And my question to you is, and I hope it's not listen to your heart, is that to go to traditional route of publishing house or, or to self-publish, to self-market. It's a very simple game. It has nothing to do with following your heart like you, him and I believe in. Yeah. It's actually very practical. You either think the upfront check from the publisher is worth it or you don't. It's not super complicated. They're going to offer you, you know, a dollar to $10 million for it, and you're gonna decide, look, I control all my stuff, but Harper Collins, the book that he sold next, makes it worth my while for the upfront cash flow for them to share in the economics on the back end. I have figured out, after writing five books, how much I think I'm gonna sell. I have a sense every year or two how much bigger my audience is, what's happening. And you know, for example, this last book, Crushing It, that just came out, it was a two book deal. We almost didn't get it done. I pushed them much harder 
than I did the last ones because I was explaining to them that I had felt a year and a half ago that I was on the verge of exploding to a next level. I ended up being right. In the last 18 months, I'm in a different place than I was for the prior eight years. It's been growing. I felt that. Thus, I made them pay me an extra million dollars after already going further than they normally went because I didn't want to leave economics on the back and I would have said, fuck it, I'll go self-publishing and I'll go on Amazon and I'll keep the economics. But if I can get my economics that I think it's worth and I can get some upfront cash flow and no risk, fine. So I think for you, when you go and do that, are they giving you the economics you believe it's worth, all the energy it's worth, but all they are is a bank, all it is is a loan. Yeah. It's just a loan, there's nothing else. So if they give you $100,000 up front and you think that's worth it, or if you calculate how much you expect to sell and you feel like that works out, then that's great. I mean, that's, that's not, listen, they're not gonna do anything. There's no marketing, there's nothing else. They're, gonna, be the they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna print it and they're gonna distribute it. Okay. It's just you want the cash up front, the end. Or the leverage of saying, you know, I'm with HarperCollins or Pegna, which by the way, carries some cachet to some groups of people. One last one yet? All right, last question. My man. Uh, My name is Tom Himan and I'm working with personal training office of intelligence. And I was raising my second round uh, in Silicon Valley and I got a phone call that, uh, when my wife called me that, I don't need to get back to home, so I lost my wife. I lost my. Uh, I got to depressed, and uh, and that's how I lost my money. And I was five months homeless. And during that time, I was told many times that I should uh, fail my first startup like everybody else. Should I? One more time. I want to make sure I understand the question. During that time, you were told by people that you sh- that you should let that first startup fail. Yeah, because many many people say that you should uh, fail your first startup. So do you believe in that? And is it rare? Go hard. Is it rare to what? Uh, rare to succeed with the first startup. No, it's not rare at all. It's rare in Silicon Valley where everybody overvaluates companies and forces. VCs have a business model. It's called raise a fund, try to make a bet on 10, 20, 30 companies and push all of them very hard because if one can actually get through, it will pay for all the others. But it doesn't care about the 29 sperm that didn't make it. So everybody gets the same advice because they're being selfish. One of the reasons I've pushed back very heavily on Silicon Valley culture over the last five years or so and stopped kind of investing the same way I did was I didn't want to, once I understood it, I'm like, wait a minute, this system sounds great at first. I don't, think, I don't think it's rare at all. I think there's a ton of small businesses that succeed on their first one, but I think they look a lot more like the guy here in the yellow shirt who says, I'm gonna take a 20 year perspective and not a 20 week perspective, right? So many people here, if you're funded or you're part of Silicon Valley, you're not actually building a business, you're building a financial arbitrage machine based on metrics that VCs want to see in growth. You're not building a company. You know, for me, so look, I mean, you obviously have dealt with, you know, you're a young dude and have already dealt with real life shit. You know, you have other emotions tied into that because it represents other things than just a company. Yeah. I think it's always a bad idea to raise more capital than you need to based on, everybody's just overextending themselves. It's like bad credit. And I think that everybody's dreaming, you know, everybody gets seduced by Instagram or Waze or Shopify, but when you look at the math, yeah, most first companies fail because people don't know what they're actually signing up for when they start raising capital. They lose their business, they start, they get caught up, right? You were raising your second round. That means most of the behavior that your company was doing after your first round was more predicated towards the things that the market needed to see for a second round than what the customers needed. The reason I've never raised money or even, you know, you know, I've run a company from the day I left school, 22, so 20 years I've been running a company every day of my life. And every day of my life I've raised no capital and every day of my life I had to make payroll every two weeks. So, you know, when I started VaynerMedia I was already successful and I started it in a conference room of another company 
for nine months and then another year of free rent in exchange for my time because I didn't want the expense. So, you know, I think that you, you need to, what you need to do is make sure that the company doesn't represent something above and beyond the company. Back to some of the themes my partner in crime here was saying. You need to make sure there's not baggage in that company that you say to yourself, this has to succeed, because if it doesn't, I lost my wife, I was home, like, it, it all, you know, you need to be very careful that this thing doesn't have some deep emotional baggage in it because one of the most important things for entrepreneurs to do is know when to not run the company anymore. It's very, you know, which is very tough. Um, so I would focus on that more than the ideological fail fast. That, guys, let's make pretend you know nothing about technology in Silicon Valley. How the fuck does fail fast make sense? It starts with fail. So I, I think there's a culture that needs to be reset in the startup ecosystem and that VCs need to be scrutinized more for what they're actually up to. By the way, this is capitalism. You took their money. Mm. Like, I, if you listen to this whole episode, I've talked out of both sides of my mouth. Yeah. I've been on the side of giving $300,000 and the founder fucking shit the bed and like, fuck you. So it goes both ways. This is not like, ooh, VC sucks. Like, there's a bunch of kids running around with stupid fucking ideas, raising $2 million and then throwing it directly in the garbage by buying $50,000 fucking squeaky tables, right? So I think that, um, I think that we as a whole need to be more thoughtful uh, and I would say that's the theme of the episode. So thank you guys for being here. My friend, you, uh, you get to ask the question of the day. So the Vayner Nation out there, anything you want, you'll get thousands of answers on YouTube and Facebook. This is a good focus group opportunity or maybe pushing some of the thoughts that you're thinking about. You get to ask the question of the day. What's your question? So I get to ask the yes. question. Well, uh, like I've been talking about the happiness. So I wanna ask, really, what's the secret behind happiness? Love it. Thank you, brother. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.